Welcome friends, James Corbett here with your thought for the day, June 1st, 2016. Today I want to concentrate on this interesting story from Bloomberg.com that is worth your time to have a quick read through. It's called The Untold Story Behind Saudi Arabia's 41-Year U.S. Debt Secret. And it requires a bit of context to understand the relevance of this story to a bigger story that's unfolding that I've been talking about for a couple of years right now and is continuing to unfold, but still some interesting pieces coming out here and there that add up to, I think, much more than what this article might let on at first glance. So let's put this article in perspective by going back to the beginning of the year when Bloomberg had this article, Saudi Arabia's secret holdings of U.S. debt are suddenly a big deal. Secret holdings? Yes, that's right. It's a secret of the vast U.S. Treasury market, a holdover from an age of oil shortages and mighty petrodollars. Just how much of America's debt does Saudi Arabia own? But now that question, unanswered since the 1970s, under an unusual blackout by the U.S. Treasury Department, has come to the fore as Saudi Arabia is pressured by plunging oil prices and costly wars in the Middle East. In the past year alone, Saudi Arabia burned through about $100 billion of foreign exchange reserves to plug its biggest budget shortfall in a quarter century. For the first time, it's also considering selling a piece of its crown jewel, state oil company Saudi Aramco. The signs of strain are prompting concern over Saudi Arabia's outside position in the world's largest and most important bond market. And this article goes on with some of the details pointing out, for example, that uh, Saudi Arabia is the world's third largest holder of foreign exchange reserves, behind, of course, China, with over $3 trillion, having been built up as the engine of the New World Order over the past couple of decades, as George Soros is fond of coining it, and uh, then Japan, and then Saudi Arabia. But it has been, and everyone knows it has been, a secret of sorts of for the last four decades. Well, how much of the U.S. Treasury market is Saudi Arabia? And the U.S. Treasury has gone out of its way to black that out by lumping Saudi Arabia in with 14 other uh, nations under a broad term oil exporters. And we know that there are $289 billion of U.S. Treasuries held by oil exporters, but how much of that is Saudi Arabia? And that's been a question, a secret uh, of sorts. It just hasn't been reported since the 1970s. And that's been known about, but it has, as this article notes, suddenly become a big deal this year, not only because of the oil glut causing the Saudi Arabian short squeeze, which has caused them to have to liquidate some of their foreign reserves and bring that home in order to plug their budget uh, shortfall, but also because of the limited hangout politics taking place around the 9-11, uh, the 28 pages and the 9-11 lawsuit distraction that the MSM has been touting recently. So Saudi Arabia warns of economic fallout if Congress passes 9-11 bill. You'll remember that story from a couple of months ago, where the New York Times estimated that uh, they had up to $750 billion in Treasury secretaries that they could dump on the markets if uh, America went ahead with their plans to allow the 9-11 victims' families to sue Saudi Arabia for culpability in 9-11. Now, obviously, there are many things to say about that from the perspective of 9-11 truth, some of which I have said on this podcast in the past, but just from the perspective of the feasibility of this alone and the question of whether this is an un unsurmountable economic shock that would throw the U.S. into turmoil, well... Uh, we can turn to some sources. For example, uh, can the U.S. Treasury market absorb a $750 billion Saudi Arabian fire sale on 247wallstreet.com that points out that, in fact, over the past 21 months, China has uh, divested itself of $780 billion in U.S. Treasuries. And despite that sell-off, interest rates on U.S. government debt has not increased since China began liquidating its treasuries. That means a $780 billion liquida liquidation in under, under two years is absorbable since it just happened. And more than absorbable, it didn't even create a, a dent in the, uh, in the treasury market. So there you go. Um, that, again, showing that this story is a lot of hype and and politics, but even that number, seven hundred fifty billion. What hat did the New York Times pull that number out of? Well, Bloomberg went on with this story, and earlier last month, in mid-May, they uh, finally, under a Freedom of Information Act request, the U.S. Treasury, for the first time ever, decided to disclose Saudi Arabia's treasury holdings. So they disaggregated it from that oil exporters number, and they revealed one hundred and sixteen point eight billion. That is the number, uh, the amount of treasuries that the Saudi uh, government holds or held in March of this year, in the first time that they ever reported that number. So 116.8 billion, a far cry from the New York Times 750 billion. Now, 
to be fair, that probably isn't 116.8 billion either. Uh, Saudi Arabia almost undoubtedly, like a lo- some other nations, puts uh, uh, has treasuries through proxies in foreign countries that then count towards those foreign countries' holdings of, uh, of U.S. treasuries rather than Saudi Arabia's holdings. So, for example, like we talked about in a previous QFC, China was secretly buying U.S. Treasuries through Belgium, um, through Euroclear in Belgium, which increased Belgium's Treasury holdings substantially in a short period of time, which was a mystery until it was traced back to China. Well, Saudi Arabia undoubtedly does a similar uh, similar things. So this $116.8 billion number is probably not right, but it is almost certainly not the $750 billion that the New York Times was reporting. Anyway, all of this is to say that this question of the secret holdings of uh, Saudi Arabia's uh, uh, treasury holdings has finally been disclosed because of Freedom of Information Act request, which led to this story in Bloomberg, the untold story behind Saudi Arabia's 41-year U.S. debt secret, which starts off like an exciting action-adventure tale. It was July 1974. A steady pre-dawn drizzle had given way to overcast skies when William Simon, newly appointed U.S. Treasury Secretary, and his deputy, Jerry Parsky, stepped onto an 8 a.m. flight from Andrews Air Force Base. On board, the mood was tense. That year, the oil crisis had hit home, an embargo by OPEC's Arab nations, payback for U.S. military aid to the Israelis during the Yom Kippur War, quadrupled oil prices. Inflation soared, the stock market crashed, and the U.S. economy was in a tailspin. Officially, Simon's two-week trip was billed as a tour of economic diplomacy across Europe and the Middle East, full of the customary meet-and-greets and evening banquets. But the real mission, kept in strict confidence within President Richard Nixon's inner circle, would take place during a four-day layover in the coastal city of Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. The goal, neutralize crude oil as an economic weapon and find a way to persuade a hostile kingdom to finance America's widening deficit with its newfound petrodollar wealth i.e. the creation of the petrodollar system. And this story focuses on this William Simon, a former a uh, former Solomon Brothers uh, broker who worked on this deal as uh, Treasury Secretary. And he's a colorful character and called himself the Genghis Khan of, Kong, Kong of Wall Street. And uh, there's stories to go around about him, but uh, the... Bloomberg article focuses on Simon's machinations and not, uh, oh, this man. Oh, yeah. Who's that? Oh, Henry Kissinger. Yeah, the real broker behind the deal. And if all of this story sounds a little bit familiar, I would hope it does so, because, of course, I did cover some of this story in my Big Oil documentary. As leaked documents from the 1973 Bilderberg meeting show, the oligarchs decided to use their control over the flow of oil to save the American hegemon. Acknowledging that OPEC could completely disorganize and undermine the world monetary system, the Bilderberg attendees prepared for an energy crisis or an increase in energy costs, which, they predicted, could mean an oil price between $10 and $12, a staggering 400% increase from the current price of $3.01 per barrel. Five months later, Bilderberg attendee and Rockefeller protege Henry Kissinger, acting as Nixon's Secretary of State, engineered the Yom Kippur War and provoked OPEC's response an oil embargo of the U.S. and other nations that had supported Israel. On October 16, 1973, OPEC raised oil prices by 70%. At their December meeting, the Shah of Iran demanded and received a further raise to $11.65 a barrel, or 400% of oil's pre-crisis price. When asked by Saudi King Faisal's personal emissary why he had demanded such a bold price increase, he replied, Tell your king... If he wants the answer to this question, he should go to Washington and ask Henry Kissinger. In the second move of the operation, Kissinger helped negotiate a deal with Saudi Arabia. In exchange for U.S. arms and military protection, the Saudis would price all their future oil sales in dollars and recycle those dollars through treasury purchases via Wall Street banks. The deal was a bonanza for the oligarchs. Not only did they get to pass the price increases on to the consumers, but they benefited from the huge flows of money into their own banks. The Shah of Iran parked the National Iranian Oil Company's revenues in Rockefeller's own Chase Bank, revenues that reached $14 billion per year in the wake of the oil crisis. With the creation of this new system, the petrodollar, the oligarchs had reached unprecedented levels of control over the economy. Not only that, they had backed the world monetary system with their commodity, oil, and brought potential competition from upstart producer nations under their control, all in one step. But for 
All right, and, and of course you can put that into context in the Big Oil documentary, and of course you can see the hyperlinked transcript for the resources and documentation about this story. But it's interesting to note that although this is not the, the details and mechanics of the petrodollar system, which really does back up interne the international monetary order in this post Bretton Woods age, is not itself controversial. I mean, it is well established at, by this point. In the 1970s, there was this deal that the, the Saudis would broker um, their oil in dollars and OPEC would go along with that and they would recycle these dollars through the U.S. banks. None of that is really controversial, but there is really a dearth of resources on in terms of documentation on the various pieces of this. We can piece it together, but from many different places, and there aren't a lot of people, despite the fact this being the backbone of the international monetary system, there are not a lot of single resources that really encapsulate or explain this story um, very succinctly. And that's, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, for example, you can go to sources uh, like this uh, this paper from uh, the uh, senior fellow, fellow at the University of Waterloo, uh, Besma Momani, GCC Oil exporters in the future of the dollar, which talks about pieces of this puzzle. Um, uh, the historic decision by OPEC to invoice the trade of oil in dollars can be traced back to a set of bilateral deals between the U.S. and Saudi Arabia. The first step towards this historic OPEC decision started in June 74 with the establishment of the United States-Saudi Arabian Joint Commission on Economic Cooperation, devised in part by U.S. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. The Joint Commission would facilitate annual meetings between Saudi finance and U.S. Treasury officials, and this Joint Commission, among amongst many other things, blah, 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 would help recycle Saudi petrodollars through the purchase of U.S. goods. So that is, as I say, the backbone of the system. And you can find bits and pieces about this all over the place. The U.S. Uh, Government Accountability Office back in March of 79 had this report on the U.S.-Saudi Arabian Joint Commission on Economic Cooperation, which was the backbone of this petrodollar agreement that was formed in 1974. And that has been made public and declassified. Basically, the uh, the GAO was saying, hey, guys, you should be advertising this to U.S. businessmen so they can take advantage of this opportunity. And that's that's the report. And you can read through this report and the details that it has on what really is the backbone of the petrodollar system um, right here in uh, in black and white. They talk quite explicitly about the different pieces of this uh, system. Um, but... Again, as I say, there aren't a lot of great resources on this. One of them that you should turn to is The Hidden Hand of American Hegemony, um, uh, Petrodollar Recycling in International Markets by David Spiro, but that is only available in hard copy. There is a preview on Google Books, so you can go and flip through some of the pages that they have available here on Google Books um, if you want to read it that way. Um, but there you go. I mean, it's it's a system that's very diffuse uh, in terms of the documentation, and you have to piece it together from many different sources to get the full picture of it. But it's starting to be talked about and mulled over in pretty mainline places like Bloomberg.com that's now starting to talk about this story and, of course, focusing on people like Simon and forgetting about people like Kissinger. But still... <laughs> At least it's a step in the right direction towards talking about this. But then, of course, we have to ask the question, why would Michael Bloomberg be interested in exposing this to the masses now? And I think this has to do with the 9-11 limited hangout covert geopolitical warfare that, as I've been documenting here for the last couple of years, is going on between the U.S. and Saudi Arabia right now, with the U.S. threatening Saudis in various different ways to try to keep them in line as the old backbone of that petrodollar order starts to collapse. And I think another sign of that is that not only, of course, is Bloomberg this billionaire Wall Street financier who's probably doesn't have your best interests in mind and is not giving you this information because it's uh, being benevolently bestowed on the masses uh, for you know their own edification. Let's also not forget that the editor in chief of Bloomberg LP is John Micklethwaite, uh, the former editor in chief of The Economist, another controlled propaganda rag. And let's not forget that at least since 1996, uh, from what we documentably, verifiably have, he has been attending Bilderberg. Um, 
alongside, of course, let's look. Yes, of course, Henry Kissinger and, uh, and of course, David Rockefeller and all of the usual crowd. He's been there hobnobbing with those people since uh, 1996, at least, at the Bilderberg meeting. So, again, I mean, Bloomberg is not pre- reporting on this because, you know, they've, they're, they're valiantly exposing the 41-year-old secret that everybody already knew about. They're doing it for a reason, for political purposes. So as I say, this goes back to the Saudi-U.S. warfare that's that's unfolding right now, the kind of jo- covert warfare, or at least threat of warfare that's happening right now, as we are watching an entire, not just a geopolitical order, but a monetary system itself is changing right now. And that change does not happen in the blink of an eye. It happens over a period of time. And undoubtedly, with all of the secret diplomacy that the general public didn't know about for decades uh, afterwards that was taking place in the 1970s during the oil crisis and the subsequent events there, just as in that situation, undoubtedly there are similar secret missions and, and, and agreements and backroom deals that are being struck right now that will form the basis of whatever order is coming next. And unfortunately, again, we are in the position of having to piece that together from the outside. But we can certainly see this happening through things like the Bloomberg starting to reveal the pieces, the pieces of the old order in time for them to pull the rug out from under Saudi Arabia if and when they need to do so. So again, if you go to CorbettReport.com and just type Saudi Arabia into the search bar or uh, maybe use the, the search by tag, and you'll find some of this reporting that I've been doing for years now on Saudi Arabia and the US and the tensions that they've been increasingly going under, which is, as I say, destabilizing not just the order in the Middle East, but the international monetary system itself. Fascinating stuff, potentially very dangerous stuff, but at any rate, we live in interesting times. So I'll leave it there for today. Um, But if you do have any good resources on either this particular, um, what's happening right now, or on the petrodollar system itself, any good overviews um, or, or... uh, pieces that we can use to 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 put more of these puzzle pieces into place, like the hidden hand of American hegemony or these GAO documents. Please do put the links in the sh- in the uh, comment section, as always, and we'll start to piece this together uh, for future reporting on the subject. Um, once again, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, thanking you for all your support that helps to make this work possible. I'm looking forward to talking to you again real soon.